Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Now at 5 o'clock, armed security inside Oxford schools tonight. Oxford parents are reacting to the Local 4 defenders. A dire assessment. We are in a crisis. There's no way around it and there's no way to sugarcoat it. Leaders at Henry Ford Health are not mincing words tonight as COVID cases have them close to a breaking point. We're going to begin though here at five with the weather and a wind advisory set to go into place later tonight. Second time in a week the region is bracing for high winds and that of course brings with it the possibility of power outages. That's right. Paul Gross is in tonight. So Paul, when is all of this going to get started here? Yeah, it'll gradually ramp up overnight. Fortunately, it shouldn't get as bad as what we had on Saturday with 60 plus mile per hour gusts, but it's going to get bad enough. So for most of us, this wind advisory goes into effect from 4 a.m. this morning and it expires at 430 tomorrow afternoon. Now for Sanilac County and areas northward it goes into effect at midnight, but that's small potatoes. That's for all of us in the middle of the night. It's going to affect the gust could be 40 to 50 miles per hour, maybe even a little bit above that. We're going to keep an eye on that. And of course, down limbs and power outages are once again in the equation. Now, right now, the wind is not too bad. You can see around 10 miles per hour, many spots a little bit above that to the north and to the west. The gusts for those stations that are reporting gusts barely even getting to 20 miles per hour. So really not windy, really not gusty right now, but you can see there's wind up aloft above the ground. You can see there on the flag and that's pushing in. Look at this temperatures in the 50s. We will stay in the 50s all through the evening. We will be dry and again, we're going to even see temps rise by midnight. We'll have more on a breakdown in terms of the timing of the wind in a few minutes. Don't forget the local forecasters app is the nation's best weather app and if you're one of the few that doesn't have it, this is the time to get it because you'll get alerts should any warnings be issued, things like that. And we, of course, send push alerts from the weather office. It's like personal communication to your cell phone. It's all free. Just go to the App Store, search under WDIV, guys. All right, Paul, our other top story at this hour for an emotional school board meeting last night in Oxford. School administrators are laying out security plans for the eventual return to school. And students are going to notice the changes in multiple ways. Sean Lay spoke to a top official in the district, and Sean joins us live now with more. Good evening, Sean. Good evening, Kimberly. These changes are already in place, and we're talking about private security teams inside Oxford schools, Oakland County Sheriff's deputies inside and outside Oxford schools, and also Oxford Village Police inside and outside Oxford schools. Now, some Oxford parents are telling us how hard it was to take their younger kids back to school once schools reopen. They're also reacting to their younger kids going back to school with law enforcement officers. But Shane, it was important for you to say something last night. Why? I felt I owed it to my kids. The meeting, Oxford's school board meeting, the parent Oxford dad, Shane Gibson, his unforgettable message. I can tell you never in my 43 years did I ever expect my eight-year-old child to ask me if me sending her to school, if she was going to die. What did you tell him? We, along with their school, are trying everything we can to make sure they're safe. Gibson's eight-year-old daughter and six-year-old son went back to school last Friday. How'd you feel about them going back? You worry, can this happen again? You know, am I going to see my kid again? But what Gibson's kids saw when they got back to school, sheriff's deputies and private security, part of Oxford School's new security plan. Those officers are stationed in the parking lot, but then also leaving their vehicles, walking through our elementaries and our middle school, um, and, and really making sure to have a strong presence throughout the community, throughout the district. Jill Lamond is in charge of security for Oxford schools. There is security that everyone can see, but you had mentioned there's security then that people can feel, an emotional security that's just as important. We've had an outpouring of love and support um, from the mental health community saying, loud and clear, you need to provide these opportunities for kids to get together. My kid instantly came home and told us about the extra security. They saw police officers. They felt safe. They felt they were happy. They came home happy. A lot more to talk about here. Clear backpacks also part of the security plan. Also, 
support animals inside schools, very much appreciated by Shane Gibson's kids and a lot of kids uh, and on all levels here very much taking advantage of counseling that is being offered. Now, Shane Gibson tells me he would like to add one more very important thing to the security plan. That would be communication. Guys, all schools here in Oxford are closed because of a threat today, but nothing more was said about that. Gibson says as a parent, he would simply like to know what the threat was, was it posted on social media, give them the exact words of the threat so they can parents can make security decisions for their kids on their own as well to be armed with information going forward. Kimberly Devon back to you can certainly understand him wanting that. Uh, Sean, you mentioned private security guards in schools. I'm just curious, are they armed? It is a local firm and most of the private security guards are either off duty police or retired police and most will be armed. That is mm -hmm. correct. OK, Sean, thanks. State is reporting 11,722 new cases of COVID-19 over the past two days. So the average at about 5,800 cases a day. That's just a bit higher than what we saw over the weekend. But the really staggering number here, look at the left side of the screen, 330 more coronavirus deaths being reported. 230 of those coming from a review of vital records. And there are some encouraging signs, though, in the seven day moving average. Taking a look at the past three Wednesdays, you can see today's number has fallen below the dip that we saw over the Thanksgiving holiday. But meanwhile, Metro Detroit hospital systems are continuing to feel the crush of COVID patients. Today, Henry Ford Health held a press briefing to express their ongoing concern. We had our Dr. Frank McGeorge uh, in on that call. He joins us now with an update. Frank, I have to believe none of this, though, comes as a surprise to you after what you saw in the ER just this past weekend. Exactly, Kim and Devin, not at all. Unfortunately, extreme waiting times just to be seen, and I'm talking about multiple hours, has become the norm. And if you need to be admitted to the hospital for any reason, that wait often easily extends into days. The frustrating part of it all for healthcare providers like me is that it doesn't need to be like this. No matter which hospital you're talking to, no matter what health system you're talking to, the word that you're going to hear about current conditions in the state of Michigan is crisis. We are in a crisis. There's no way around it. and There's no way to sugarcoat it. On any given day, our emergency departments are either at capacity or close to it and oftentimes serving as inpatient units because we don't have any beds available in our standard inpatient units or our ICU. That's Bob Riney, Chief Operating Officer for the Henry Ford Health System. He and Dr. Adnan Munkara emphasized the biggest contributing factor to this are people who remain unvaccinated. About 75 to 80 percent of hospitalized, hospitalized patients with COVID are unvaccinated. And over 85 percent of patients who are in the ICU and or, or are on ventilators in the ICU are unvaccinated. Dr. Jackie Flom Carlson cares for COVID patients in both the ER and intensive care unit. It's heartbreaking because we know that the patients are led astray by the social media or false information. And it is so heartbreaking to walk them down this path of death, uh, knowing that it was preventable. Now, these long waiting times for care in the hospital is seriously wearing on everyone. And I understand patients are completely understandably frustrated and often angry, but that's led to uncivil and frankly disrespectful behavior toward our staff, kind of like what's being reported in airline passengers. The only thing I can say is everyone is doing their best in really draining circumstances and we're pleading for a little kindness. Would be nice, Frank. I, I, I know you don't want to tell patients not to come to the emergency room if they need to, but uh, how are you advising people with maybe problems that aren't quite as urgent? Well, you know, there are the obvious, of course, primary care doctor, an urgent care center, or even a telemedicine visit. But, you know, one other thing that we're seeing more of are people coming to the ER to get COVID tested. Uh. And we actually want to discourage that. Frankly, testing is available all over the place, and you do not need an ER for that. Yeah, well, treat your doctors and nurses well so that they can treat you. All right, thanks, Frank. Uh, good news for Detroit teens who are due for a COVID booster shot.
That's right. The city is offering Pfizer booster shots to 16 and 17 year olds at all Detroit Health Department vaccination locations. Walk ins are welcome, but you must bring your vaccination card. The move comes after the CDC and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services approved boosters for the age bracket. To be eligible, a teen must have completed their primary doses of the Pfizer vaccine at least six months ago. President Biden is on the ground this afternoon in Kentucky. His first up close look at the devastation from deadly tornadoes that cut through five states over the weekend. Dozens of people, of course, were killed, but hundreds still missing. And as that search continues across the strike zone, the president looked to console survivors while promising federal help for as long as it's needed. Jay Gray coming to us from Dawson Springs tonight. Good evening, Jay. Good evening, and I am standing in the middle of what used to be a home here. It's not even really recognizable at this point. And this area is in the middle of what is the apparent path of the storm. In a town that for the most part is gone, the days are measured now by piles. Piles of down trees sawed and stacked. Piles of debris, parts of homes and lives torn apart and scattered for miles and the smallest but most important piles, keepsakes pulled from the rubble. Personal things, that was, uh, we found a reel of music from my dad, my late dad. Uh, he was a singer, so we've been finding stuff like that, pictures, uh, all my brother's tools. There's no tool that can repair the damage here. That's going to take heavy equipment, a lot of help, and time. President Biden getting his first in-person look at the devastation, promising federal support will continue until this community and others across the strike zone come back. And so uh, I just want you to know the help that we're able to offer at the federal level is not just now. Survivors appreciate the president's visit and his promise, but don't have a lot of time to think about it. There's just too much work to do right now and too much that's been lost. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know. I mean, this is my life and it's gone. Like so much here, stolen in just minutes by the storm. Minutes that left scars it will take years to heal. In Dawson Springs, Kentucky, Jay Gray, Local 4. All right, Jay. By the way, the Kentucky bourbon industry, you know, is a crucial part of that state's economy. They're trying to step in with relief efforts. Parent company of Jim Beam and Makers Mark has donated a million dollars to help, and they're going to have an unprecedented auction of rare bottles of whiskey. That's being organized right now and could end up raising just as much, maybe, maybe more. Uh, new developments tonight in that horrible crash involving kids from a Metro Detroit group home. Why the investigation has taken a sudden turn amid questions over how those kids were able to take that car in the first place. Also, she was suddenly fighting for her life while 23 weeks pregnant. A new mother sharing her story of surviving COVID after spending days on a ventilator. But first, somebody knows something. Family demands answers after the murder of a mother of nine. We'll have that story and more next.